Welcome back to Biographics. I'm your host, Cosmic Horror Madman, because, you know, I'm a published author of Cosmic Lovecraftian Horror, Eric Malachite, and today's protagonist is not a person, but rather a company known as the Pony Express. Be sure to give the author of today's script, Larry Holsworth, some love in the comments and tell us what your favorite thing about the Pony Express is. That said, get ready to deploy your likes and comments and gear up for a wild ride. Pun intended. In late 1859, a recruiting poster appeared on billboards and street posts throughout the American Western frontier. Wanted, it read, young, skinny, wiry fellows not over 18. Must be expert writers willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred. Wages, $25 per week. This was an alleged ad for one of the most fabled and shortest lived adventures of the American West, the Pony Express, which for those unfamiliar, sought riders to carry the mail on horseback in a series of relays that stretched from Missouri to California. The route crossed over 1900 miles of mostly unsettled territory, much of it populated with hostile Indian tribes who, understandably, didn't take too kindly to strangers crossing their land. The Pony Express was born out of the need to improve communications with the state of California and the wealthy mining communities of the Nevada Territory in the months preceding the Civil War. At the time, a journey from New York to San Francisco via ship around Cape Horn took months, subject to the foibles of the weather and human error. It could be shortened by disembarking along the Isthmus of Panama, crossing the Pacific via steamship and wagon, and joining another ship near present-day Panama City. Such a journey was fraught with peril, not the least of which were yellow fever, malaria, and slipping on wet rocks while disembarking. Another option for the journey was overland via stagecoach. Coaches ran on a more or less scheduled basis, usually connecting with towns located near army posts. They were subject to attacks from Red Dead 2 missions. Read Bandits. Thanks, Carl. And even if a traveler avoided those perils, the journey was slow as the molasses the coaches may have been carrying, with weeks required to travel from St. Joseph in Missouri to Sacramento, California. A third option was joining one of the wagon trains that slowly plodded westward along the well-worn trails. They too were slow, taking months to make the journey, if they made it at all. None of the available options were reliable, and none were suitable for actually transmitting news in any reasonable time frame, be it by mail or newspaper. The Pony Express was a solution to that problem, though it was a short-lived one. It was in operation for just 18 months, and in that time it became a legend of the American West. The romantic image of a lone rider facing and triumphing over the dangers posed by vast distances, inclement weather, hostile Indians, and roving bandits is part of Western mythology. In truth, it was a massive undertaking, a business that ultimately failed when it proved massively unprofitable. Still, it is fondly remembered as part of American history as an attempt to overcome the imposing geography of the continent, because what's more American than charging headfirst into a bad idea and refusing to admit you're wrong? Thanks again, Carl. California was a well-known land of myth to most Americans when gold was discovered there in 1848. The gold rush triggered by that discovery led to a rapid expansion of its population from arriving gold seekers and other entrepreneurs and settlers. As an aside, most gold prospectors failed to make any money during the gold rush, with even the guy whose land gold was first discovered on, John Sutta, being bankrupted by it. But that is the story for another day, although we will leave you with a salient piece of advice about prospecting that emerged during this time. During a gold rush, don't dig, sell shovels. Anyway, about half of these arrived in California by sea, disembarking in San Francisco, which became a boomtown. From there, they traveled up the Sacramento River to the gold fields. The other half, more or less, traveled west via wagon trails, which included the Oregon Trail. Yes, the one from the video game that let players die of dysentery. Their terminus was also in the region of Sacramento. The overland route established by the gold seekers who became known to history as the 49ers from the peak year of the gold rush was later used as the favored route by the Pony Express. California became a state in 1850, part of the Compromise of 1850, as yet another attempt to stave off the Civil War over the issue of slavery. The new state remained largely isolated due to its location, far distant from the eastern states. Yet, over the ensuing decade, its importance to the nation grew. 
it was vastly rich in far more than just gold, and due to the nature of its rapid settlement, it was populated with both pro-slavery and anti-slavery factions. Communication between California and the East grew more and more critical as the nation careened towards secession and war. Neither the telegraph nor the railroads had spanned the distance across the West. Towns and settlements located in the territories were isolated from both coasts as well as each other. Military outposts dotted the territories and required shipping companies to provide them with supplies. One such shipping company was the Russell Majors and Waddell firm, which serviced military outposts in the Wyoming and Colorado territories. In 1859, its three principals, William Russell, Alexander Majors, and William Waddell, formed a new company intended to carry mail and freight between California and the new settlements in the Rocky Mountains, spurred by the discovery of gold near Pikes Peak. They named the new company the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company, which just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Understandably, this was shortened to the CCO and PP Express. Yes, they really did name their company the PP Express. The PP Express. Carl even has a note here saying PP Express. Yes, we're all very mature here. <laughs> <laughs> the company also operated routes to outposts in the Wyoming Territory. Now, although it carried mail, the service was necessarily slow, with mail waiting until full freight loads were ready and then moving at a plodding pace. Which of the three partners first hit upon the idea of a fast-moving mail service is uncertain, but it was Russell who first mentioned one in a letter dated January 27, 1860. Russell wrote, have determined to establish a Pony Express to Sacramento, adding his belief that such an endeavor could be in operation by April. The three partners had considerable experience in organizing shipping routes, which also required way stations for fresh horses, as well as stables, reliable water supplies, feed, and drivers. Their first step in the new project was selecting the best possible route connecting St. Joseph, Missouri, where the railroad ended, and Sacramento. They divided the route between St. Joseph and Salt Lake City, which was fairly well known, into three divisions. St. Joseph to Fort Kearney in Nebraska, from there to Horseshoe Station, Wyoming Territory, and thence to Salt Lake City. The route from Salt Lake City to Sacramento was then known only to explorers and hunters. The PP Express... <laughs> The PP Express established two divisions along the route. In 1859, the three partners had begun building a road to haul freight between Sacramento and Salt Lake City across central Nevada. Throughout 1859, the company built the road and about 200 relay stations along it. The amenities of these stations varied and generally fell into one of two designations way stations and home stations. Whilst way stations were simply brief stops where riders would change horses, home stations changed both horse and rider, providing facilities for both. The PP Express ultimately established the Pony Express as a separate wholly owned company in early 1860 with a headquarters on Montgomery Street in San Francisco and in St. Joseph, Missouri. Branch offices were established in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, and other eastern cities. Mail delivered to the offices in the east was shipped by train to St. Joseph, where it was transferred to the riders. Mail heading eastward followed a reverse path. To carry the mail, the company hired between 80 and 100 riders, but riders were far from the only personnel needed. Each of the nearly 200 stations required a station master to operate it. Corrals were needed for the horses, and wranglers and stock keepers were needed to man the corrals and stables. Stations required supplies, delivered by the PP Express's wagons, which required drivers and loaders. Over 60,000 oxen and mules were purchased to haul the wagons. Then there were, of course, the horses, which the company also needed hundreds of since the Pony Express was to be a 24-hour operation. All in all, the company bought about 500 horses, largely California Mustangs, though some legs used horses better suited for the environment they'd need to traverse. Either way, the horses were, in many cases, fed better than their riders, being given the highest quality grain possible and outperformed other horses by the era. By such an extent, many riders could avoid bandit or Indian raids by simply being too fast to catch. To anybody on a regular crappy horse, it was almost like Pony Express riders were riding in actual Mustangs. By April 1860, when the Pony Express first opened, 186 stations were in place, averaging about 15 miles apart, with 80 riders ready to carry the mail.
In addition to being young and wiry, as mentioned in the intro, the writers were required to swear an oath in which they promised to forsake liquor, profanity, and fighting, sworn before the great and living God. Do they mean Cthulhu? Most of the writers were young and inexperienced, and many were indeed orphans or runaways claiming to be orphans looking to score that sweet, sweet $25 per week. For the curious, this is equivalent to about $950 a week today, so not bad, but not exactly great for a job where you literally risked being attacked by the cast of Red Dead 2 at any moment. Also, that ad we mentioned at the start, it may have been quite fittingly total horseshit as some top Pony Express historians who probably know quite a bit about this Pony Express business believe it may have been fake, though nobody is quite sure. As for stuff we can actually verify, Mark Twain personally observed the Pony Express in operation and described the writers in his memoir called Roughing It as a little bit of a man. The riders were necessarily small, since the company mandated the combined weight of rider, saddle, accoutrements, and mail would not exceed 165 pounds. The mail, carried in a specially designed leather pouch, weighed 20 pounds. Most riders carried nothing else beyond a pistol and a canteen. The weight restriction meant most riders weighed 125 pounds or less. The lighter the man, the better for the horse, as majors would say. Most were teenage boys, motivated by the relatively high pay for the day and the sense of adventure, though some riders were older, with riders in their mid-40s not being uncommon. Likewise, riders as young as 11 were believed to have rode for the service, though records are annoyingly sparse in this regard. To earn that pay, which exceeded $100 per month at a time when the average laborer earned less than $20, riders covered an average of 75 miles per shift, changing horses at each way station. Since the riders simply swung through them, they were also called swing stations. They rode day and night, seven days per week. Like the riders, the horses were small, averaging just over 14 hands at the withers, roughly 4 feet 8 inches in height at the top of the front shoulder. Though most were not ponies in strictly technical terms, they were more or less pony-sized. Hence the name Pony Express. The saddles were specially designed, made with lightness and durability in mind. Covering the saddle was a device called a mochila, which was held in place over the saddle by the rider sitting on it. Along the sides of the mochila were four containers of hard leather called cantinas, two in front and two in back, which carried the mail. When the rider arrived at a station, they would simply dismount, grab the mochila, sling it over the saddle on a waiting horse tended by the station master, mount, and continue on his way. If he was at the final stop of his leg, he gave the mochila to his relief rider. The only other thing riders carried besides this was a canteen of water, a gun, and a Bible. Initially, some riders also carried a rifle, but this was deemed to be an unnecessary amount of additional weight. Reminder, riders were routinely shot at. For some reason, this argument was never raised in regard to the Bible writers carried. Between stations, the riders did not proceed at a full gallop, as often depicted in film, unless they were being pursued or were badly behind schedule. The standard gait for each leg, which was between 10 and 15 miles, was a brisk trot, with an average speed of about 10 miles per hour. Hardly a blistering pace, but still impressive given the terrain, time period, and the fact that the horses only had comparatively tiny little legs. As the rider continued on the journey, the station master tended to the newly arrived horse, and ensured a horse was ready for another arriving rider in either direction. Since the express was a 24-hour-a-day operation, most station masters employed one or more assistants to aid them in their duties. The riders were exposed to the ravages of the Paiute Indians during the Paiute War in Nevada from May through July 1860. So were the station masters and other personnel. In fact, the Paiute War demonstrated that working at the stations was more dangerous than carrying the mail. Stations were raided for their valuable livestock, the stations themselves burned, and their occupants killed usually in gruesome ways as a warning to future trespassers. The Pony Express lost over $75,000 in property during the Paiute War, and at least 16 employees were killed, all but one being station employees. Only once was a rider killed by Indians in transit, but the Paiute had no use for the mail he carried and left it behind when they fled. The rider was 14-year-old Billy Tate, who had been ambushed by 12 Paiute Braves on his way to Dry Creek, Nevada. Unlike many victims of similar Indian ambushes, Tate's body was found unscalped, suggesting he'd somehow earned the respect of his pursuers. 
How, you may ask? Well, when Tate's body was found, it wasn't alone, being surrounded by seven dead Indians and evidence that he'd managed to injure several more. A feat that's double impressive when you realize riders were only equipped with a six-shooter. Meaning, it's entirely possible Tate had taken out literally half of his ambushers in one volley, reloaded, and then proceeded to almost take out the rest before being taken down by a storm of arrows at 14 years old. Hell, when Tate's arrow-riddled body was found, he was still clutching his empty gun. What we're saying is that this boy went out swinging. Hey! Two years later, his mail pouch was discovered and dutifully delivered to its destination, though by then the Pony Express had ceased to exist. Still, it was a more symbolic thing, you know? James Butler Hickok, known as Wild Bill, long claimed to have been a writer for the Pony Express. Spoilers, he wasn't. Hickok, however, did at least work for the company, briefly as a stockkeeper, meaning he managed a stable feeding and watering livestock and shoveling the same kind of shit he'd spew from his mouth as an outlaw. As such, it was a considerably less glamorous position than that of a writer. Buffalo Bill Cody greatly exaggerated his stories of being a writer for the Pony Express, as he did with many of his claims of achievements in the West. However, Cody did ride for the Pony Express at the age of 15. Cody even claimed one ride of 322 miles, which took over 21 continuous hours in the saddle, using 21 horses, which he called the longest ride in the history of the Pony Express. His claim is unsupported by company records, but added to his considerable reputation. Cody's claim to have made the longest ride is also disputed by the reports of another rider, Jack Keatley. Keatley rode for the Pony Express for the entirety of its existence. Keatley is reported to have ridden some 340 miles in 30 hours, stopping only to change horses, having doubled back over his own route when a rider scheduled to travel in that direction failed to materialize. He was said to be asleep in the saddle when he arrived at his destination, yet Keatley himself disputed that report, claiming his longest ride was said to be 300 miles and was done a few minutes inside of 24 hours. Keatley also claimed his ride took place between Fort Kearney and St. Joseph. Although the topic is debated from time to time, company records do not not support the notion that some writers were female, disguised as boys. However, many women did work for the company in various positions and roles, just not as writers. In more modern times, you have things like the Pony Express Association, which occasionally recreates sections of the historical journeys of writers back then, which boasted, at least in 2014, 60% female writership. The Pony Express offered speedy delivery, with the company guaranteeing delivery between its furthest apart stations in just 10 days, but it was expensive. Rates were based on weight. At the beginning of service in April 1860, a half ounce letter cost $5, equivalent to roughly $175 in today's money, payable in golden cash, whichever you find easier. By contrast, a letter weighing four times as much could be posted via the US mail for two cents about 75 cents today. The cost meant that the primary source of customers for the Pony Express were businesses. Business customers allowed the Pony Express to manage costs by providing its own lightweight paper and envelopes to customers, saving weight and thus saving costs as well as making money by selling stationery. This lighter Pony Express paper cut costs considerably, allowing businesses to send a 10-page letter for about $2.50, literally having the cost of using regular paper. Just like with the Gold Rush, the path to potential profit was in selling the tools, not doing the work yourself. According to the Smithsonian, the Pony Express, though it existed for just 18 months, went through four distinct rate periods. The first period from April to July 1860 was the most expensive. That summer, the company attempted to reduce rates in the hope of increasing its customer base. The company began measuring weight by quarter ounce rather than half ounce, whereas before it had simply rounded up to the next half ounce. These rates remained in place until April 1861. That month, Wells Fargo and company took over management of the routes and reduced rates to $2 per half ounce, the third period. Finally, in July 1861, Wells Fargo reduced the rates to $1 per ounce, which still greatly exceeded the rates charged by the U.S. Post Office by a considerable margin. Because of these expensive rates, the Pony Express was never popular for personal mail, and remained mostly what would be considered a business courier service in modern parlance. Because, let's be real, 
If it cost $100 to send your mom a birthday card, you'd probably opt to have it arrive late and pay the 75 cents instead. Businesses, though, often didn't have the luxury of time, and business communications and news, including stock market information, was a common source of mail for the Express. Shippers could notify customers of shipping dates as well as estimated dates of arrival. By June 1860, mail was routinely transiting between Sacramento and St. Joseph in 9 or 10 days, most of it business-oriented. From those cities, it continued on its destination via the U.S. mail, telegraph, or private couriers. The Pony Express lobbied hard to obtain a contract to carry U.S. mail along its route. Its failure to do so helped contribute to its early demise. Congress awarded the lucrative mail contract to the Overland Stage Route in a series of deals involving bribes, kickbacks, and other extra-legal machinations. The history of the American West is rife with corrupt contractual arrangements, bribes, and other such activities happily endorsed by some of the politicians of the day, but alas, that's a story for another time. By late summer 1860, the telegraph was encroaching upon the Pony Express. Fort Kearney, Nebraska was the westernmost telegraph station reachable from the east, while in the west the telegraph had reached Fort Churchill in the Nevada Territory. Efforts to connect the two outposts continued through the summer and autumn of 1860. Once connected, a faster means of communication would render the Pony Express, not yet one year old, wholly obsolete. The presidential election of 1860 was the most consequential event of American history at the time. Several southern states had threatened to secede from the Union over the issue of slavery if the Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln succeeded in winning the presidency. William Russell, one of the three principals in the Pony Express and its largest investor, wanted to use the election to emphasize the speed with which the service could disseminate the news to California and the Western territories. He hired additional writers and positioned them at stations between Fort Kearney and Fort Churchill. Lincoln was elected on November 6th, 1860, though the victory wasn't known until early morning on November 7th. It was immediately sent by telegraph to Fort Kearney. From there, word of Lincoln's victory was carried by Pony Express riders to Fort Churchill, despite much of the trail across Nevada being covered in freshly fallen snow. From Fort Churchill, the news was telegraphed to Sacramento and San Francisco. In just under eight days after Washington newspapers announced Lincoln's victory, the news was reported in San Francisco, Virginia City, and other western cities still not connected directly to the east by telegraph. In the previous election, in 1856, just four years earlier, word of the results did not reach the west coast until over two months had elapsed. The election of 1860 was a clear indication of the manner in which the Pony Express had linked the nation, but it was also the beginning of the end. Southern states began clamoring for secession conventions, Missouri among them. In the end, Missouri did not secede, but became a border state torn by factional strife for most of the Civil War. In March 1861, the Pony Express ceased operations between St. Joseph and Salt Lake City. Its stations and other infrastructure were taken over by stagecoach operations run by Benjamin Holliday, known in the West and among the congressmen he bribed as the Stagecoach King. With the new mail contracts, mail to Salt Lake City from the east was delivered by stage. The Pony Express continued to operate between Salt Lake City and Sacramento through the summer of 1862, carrying U.S. mail. In October of that year, the Telegraph finally connected Omaha, Nebraska with Sacramento via Salt Lake City. Two days later, on October 26, 1862, the Pony Express ceased operations and Holiday quickly acquired its remaining assets. In the roughly 18 months of operation, the Pony Express had generated losses of $200,000, about $6.2 million today. It had simply been an unsustainable endeavor, its costs far outweighing its benefits to customers, but it had been a romantic adventure for many and saw quite a few people make out like bandits, including, quite literally, quite a few bandits. Buffalo Bill Cody stressed that romanticism in his Western shows, which became wildly popular in the 19th and early 20th centuries, stressing, of course, his own involvement. Soon, the Pony Express became a popular subject for dime novels, pulp magazines, and popular fiction. The film industry took up the mantle in the 1930s and 1940s, and as recently as 2012, the documentary Spirit of the Pony Express. 
Television also celebrated the Pony Express, including episodes of the long-running Western Bonanza and the 1989-92 series The Young Riders, which featured Stephen Baldwin as William Cody long before he was known as Buffalo Bill. It also featured Josh Brolin as Wild Bill Hickok. This romanticization has annoyingly led to much of the misinformation about the actual events that took place back then with images like riders hauling an ungodly amount of ass on horseback being pursued by an army of Indians not being entirely reflective of the day-to-day -day drudgery of working for the service. I mean, this absolutely did happen, just not as often as Hollywood would have you believe. Most of the route followed by the Pony Express is accessible today, with much of it controlled by the Federal Bureau of Land Management. In 1992, Congress designated much of the route as a National Historic Trail. It passes through eight states, can be covered by a car, and includes reconstructed stations as well as the ruins of some of the originals. Over four dozen such stations can be visited along the more than 1,800 miles of the route. The western end of the original route is located at the Pony Express Terminal at the B.F. Hastings Bank in Old Sacramento State Historic Park, Sacramento, California. Say that five times fast, I dare you. The eastern terminus is at the Patti House Museum in St. Joseph, Missouri, when the Pony Express was running. The Patti House was a hotel, one of the largest in Missouri, and the sign to the company's eastern headquarters. The actual end of the ride for those arriving in St. Joseph was at the nearby Pikes Peak Stables, named for the PP Express, which operated it, and today is a museum dedicated to the Pony Express. The building was the site of the beginning of the first ride on the Pony Express on April 3rd, 1860. Though the Pony Express failed as a business for numerous reasons, it remains an important and remembered part of American history. It was one of the several attempts to figuratively unite the sprawling country in the mid-19th century. Before it began operation, the idea of covering the distance between western Missouri and the California coast in just 10 days was considered madness. It achieved that goal on its first run and continued to achieve it despite the obstacles for the short time it remained in business. Nothing surpassed its speed in delivering the mail over that distance until the opening of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. Like much of the history of the American West, the Pony Express is shrouded in myth and romanticism. Most of its nearly 100 riders, its station masters, and the many hundreds of employees who made it work, even for just a short time, are forgotten to history. But the Pony Express lives on. In 2006, the United States Postal Service announced they had trademarked the name Pony Express. Whether they intend to actually use it remains, to date, unknown. I hope you learned something today, and if you dug this video, be sure to deploy a like, comment down below, and share this video with someone who loves learning about history. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.